Welcome to Hidden in Plain Sight, an interactive 360 degree tour of the Oxford you never noticed. If you're viewing on a smartphone or a tablet, it's best to use the YouTube app, as this will allow you to pan and tilt your device around to choose what you're looking at. If you're viewing on a desktop or laptop computer, you can use your mouse cursor to click and drag the image. Enjoy the 360 experience, which will begin on Oxford's High Street. So we're now in front of the University Examination Schools, a building that may still strike fear into the heart of anybody who had to enter these doors to sit their finals. You might notice that I'm in a very lofty position. In fact, I'm even taller than the double-decker buses going past on the High Street. That's because I've been raised up on what's called a scissor lift. And if you look down below, you might be able to see it. But that's not really what we've come here to have a look at. What I'd like to show you is the two relief plaques on either side of the front entrance. They were carved by a firm of architects or stonemasons called Farmers and Brindley. London stonemasons who went on to do carvings on the Natural History Museum as well. And they tell you a little bit about the purpose of the building. Because on the left hand side, you can see there's a young man sitting at a table. He's a student because he's wearing a gown. Facing him across the table are three dons who are really putting him through his paces. They're asking him to defend his thesis in what's known as a viva voce or viva examination. On the right hand side, three more students. This time they're kneeling and they're kneeling in front of a don who's using his mortarboard and a book to hit them over the head or at least that's what it looks like, and that's how John Betjeman described it. What he's actually doing is he's conferring their degrees on them. And as you probably know, your degree ceremony these days takes place in the Sheldonian Theatre, but this building, the examination schools, has on occasion been used for graduation ceremonies. We're now going to move from here, around the back of the building, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the architecture and about the architect too. So I'm now even higher, high enough to see the broken tiles on the roof of the examination schools and I'm round the back and almost really on eye level with the pigeons. So this building was built between 1876 and 1872 and the architect was a young man called Thomas Jackson. He was really the surprise choice for the job because the style of architecture that he favoured was what hadn't really been seen in Oxford until this point. People had favoured what they called robust Gothic, strong, sensible medieval buildings. And what Jackson favoured was a more Italianised, feminised Gothic, a style that's actually become known as Anglo-Jackson. If you look around you here, you can see it's more ornamental. You could almost say it's Gothic with twiddly bits. When Jackson built this building, it was, it was controversial at the time. And Arthur Evans, who was the keeper of the Ashmolean, bemoaned the impoverishment of the university due to the marble palace of examinations. These days, at its peak, about a thousand people an hour can come in and out of this building for lectures, and maybe 1,200 people a day come here to sit their exams, wearing their traditional black and white, what's known as sub-fusk. They sit their exams in rooms that are known as the North School, the South School, and the East School, and downstairs, inside this building, you'll still find there are two rooms, one labelled resuscitation room, the other labelled theatre, which tell us a little bit about the history of this building during the First and the Second World War as the third 
Southern General Hospital Military Headquarters. We're going to go from here around Merton Street and have a look at the front of Merton College. So we're in front of Merton College, the first fully self-governing college in the university. It was founded in 1264 by Walter de Merton. He's the figure standing here on the right-hand side. He was Chancellor of England and later became the Bishop of Rochester. And he's holding in his hand what looks like a rather diminished money bag. Clearly founding a college was a very expensive business. On the left, there's King Edward I. So this part of the college, the gatehouse, wasn't added until the 1400s. And before it could be added, Merton had to obtain what's called a license to crenellate. That meant a permission to add the battlemented features that you can see at the top of the gatehouse. It was later on, between 1464 and 1465, that this relief panel here, known as the Stone of St. John, was inserted. You can see there he is standing on the right hand side, John the Baptist. He's holding a book in his hand and his other hand is outstretched. In front of him is Walter de Merton, the bishop, kneeling down. Everything in this panel is symbolic. They're all there for a reason. You can see there's a unicorn with a very long horn. The unicorn is there to represent the incarnation of Christ. Then there's the lion's head representing the resurrection. And in front of him, there's a very large lamb representing the sacrifice. The book in the middle is the book of the seven seals. And as I said, everything's symbolic and it's all about the New Testament. You might notice there's a few other creatures in here as well. We've got one, two, three dogs. And then have you seen all these little bunnies? There are lots of rabbits going in and out of the burrows at the bottom. Some people interpret those as being the wayward souls and maybe the dogs are trying to keep them in order. Just look along the top of the panel as well. There are seven trees there all together, all different species. The second one in is an orange tree representing fecundity. And then in the middle above the book, there's an oak tree representing fidelity. You might also have spotted there are quite a few birds in these trees. And there's a star shape. That's the sun of righteousness. One small detail I'd like to point out because I'm very lucky. I'm actually on a level so that I can see the repair in 1896 on the occasion of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Unfortunately, when putting up the lights outside the college, one of the workmen by mistake knocked off the head of this dog here. You can see it's been added later, but I wasn't able to see that on ground level. We're going to cross from here across the high street and we're going to go towards the Radcliffe camera. And on the way, I'd like to show you another Oxford feature that you may never have noticed before. So because there's some very noisy scaffolding work going on in St Mary's Tower, we've come here to the back of the Divinity School so that I can tell you a little bit about the Narnia doorway. It used to be the entrance to the City Arms pub. It's now part of Brasenose College, and it's become known as the Narnia doorway because of those two golden fawns on either side. One of them's holding a set of pan pipes. Many people look at these fawns and see them as being connected with the land of Narnia invented by C.S. Lewis. You might remember at the beginning of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Lucy Pevensey pushes through the fur coats at the back of the wardrobe and she enters the snowy land of Narnia. And she's lucky enough to meet there Mr. Tumnus the Fawn, who's standing beneath the lamppost and he offers her tea and buttered toast. When C.S. Lewis, who had lodgings near this spot, was asked, was this the inspiration for the land of Narnia? He didn't accept it, but he didn't deny it either. You might recognize where we're standing now, and you might hear in the background, there's quite a lot of scaffolding noise because there's people working on the tower of St. Mary's Church. 
the neoclassical jewel in Oxford's crown. The Radcliffe camera looks as though it's always been here. It looks as though it was meant to be here, situated in the heart of Oxford. But actually it was only built between 1737 and 1749. It's named after Dr. John Radcliffe, who gave £40,000 in his will for the construction and maintenance of a new library in Oxford. Dr. Radcliffe was actually a student at UNIF, just down the road. He went there when he was only 13 years old. And then he went on to have a very successful medical career, numbering Queen Mary and King William III among his patients. So the large fortune that he bequeathed went towards the demolishing of lots of tenement buildings and gardens that were on this site, and also the building of the world's first circular library by James Gibbs. James Gibbs made his name later on as the architect of the Church of St. Martin's in the Fields in London. But he took his inspiration from this building, from Nicholas Hawksmoor. And Hawksmoor's wooden model of the circular building that he envisaged on this site is still in the collection of the Ashmolean Museum. And at one point in its history, it was actually owned by Ditchley Park in Oxfordshire, where it's said that it was used as a doll's house. Why don't you come with me? Because we've been lucky enough to be granted access early in the morning before any students have even arrived. It feels really exciting to be up early on a Monday morning with the sun just rising over Oxford and to be standing beneath this wonderful painted ceiling in the upper reading room. Above the doorway, you'll find a statue, a statue of John Radcliffe, the founder, the fundator of this library. Here he is. It was sculpted by a Flemish sculptor called John Michael Reisbach. And you'll see he's made John Radcliffe look like a man of action. He's got one foot forward, he has one leg bent. He's holding towards us what looks like a scroll. Beside him, there's a tree stump, and entwined around the tree stump, there's a serpent, the symbol of Asclepius, the Greek god of healing and medicine, whose attribute is normally seen as a rod entwined with a snake. This library, or this space, since 1945, has been at the home of the History Faculty Library. It also contains books relating to art history and education. We're now standing beneath the mini dome of the lower reading room. In the middle, you can see there's the crest of Dr. John Radcliffe. This room was originally planned as what's known as an ambulatory space, an open ambulatory space, a space in which to mix and mingle, to maybe get to know your fellow readers. That created a bit of a problem at one point in its history when it became a place where the ladies of the night used to congregate. And according to my godson, who's actually a current student at Jesus College. This place is still a library in which you don't necessarily study very hard, but you do check out your fellow readers. The books in this part of the library relate to English literature and theology. And we're going to go from here, deep down, into the space underneath the lower reading room and look at the Gladstone link. So we're now standing in the upper Gladstone link, with deep beneath the Radcliffe camera. Deep beneath Radcliffe Square, actually. Uh, and it's called the upper Gladstone link because uh, this is named after Prime Minister William Gladstone, who sketched out ideas for the ceiling brackets that you can see on the top of the library shelves here. These days, and since 2011, this space has been an underground library, uh, but it was actually built at the beginning of the 20th century when the library realised that it had hit the one million mark. It had one million books in its collection and it needed extra storage space. So they dug down deep, deep beneath the library and this was for 
some period of its history, the largest underground bookstore in the world. We're going to go from here into the Space Age Tunnel that's going to take us back in time to the old Bodleian Library. So we've just walked up the old wooden staircase and entered this rather dark and incredibly atmospheric space, which is the Duke Humphreys Library. In 1447, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, the younger brother of King Henry V, donated to Oxford University 281 valuable manuscripts, the seedbed for this library. At that point, the university didn't have a space large enough in which to house those manuscripts, and so it had to build one. And it was built above the Divinity School, which was then under construction. The library opened in 1488, but sadly, it closed just 60 years later. It fell foul of the Reformation, and also to the attentions of people like the Dean of Christchurch, who was on a mission to purge the university of any superstitious or suspect items. These days, the library is still used by readers. And you can see behind me, there are lots of books on the shelves still. I have to be very careful, actually, not to touch these ones, because I'll set off an alarm if I do. The ones here are the large ones up above, and the, um, the staircases above. Uh, there are smaller books. There are books in all sorts of different languages, from Greek to ancient Hebrew, to from French to Chinese. But there aren't that many books in English in this section of the library at least. And I'll tell you more about why that is later on. In medieval times, books were so valuable that these ones in the Duke Humphreys Library had to actually be attached to the shelves using chains. It's said that the price of one of these books would have been equivalent to the cost of four cows. And when you consider the amount of uh, ink and paper and the labor that went into them, that really makes sense. This one here is really just an example, because since the 1800s, these books have no longer been chained to the shelves. At that date, people decided that actually the chains were too noisy, and so they had to be scrapped. But you can see the books on the shelf above, just here, are actually placed with their spines against the wall. That's because the chains couldn't be placed on the spines, because that would have been damaging, and so they have to be placed on the cover. The spines go in against the wall so that the chains don't get tangled up. You might have noticed the numbers on the page ends as well. Those represent the catalogue numbers and a way of finding the book that you wanted. After the Reformation, in 1598, a man called Thomas Bodley decided to come to the library's rescue. He was looking around for a retirement project, really. He'd been working in the court of Queen Elizabeth I for some time, and he wanted something new to do. And as an alumnus of Oxford University, he decided what he was going to do was to plough lots of money and time into restoring the library. He was lucky he had money, part, partly thanks to his wife, who was the widow of a wealthy filchard merchant. And so Thomas Bodley bought new books, he restored the space, and by 1602, when the library reopened as the Bodleian Library, there were 2,500 items in its collection. In 1610, Thomas Bodley also made another very important move. He set up a connection, an agreement, with the Stationers Company of London, that every time something was published in this country, whether it was a map or a book or something printed, a copy of it, one copy, would come to the University of Oxford and come to the Bodleian Library. That incredibly useful agreement means that now there are 14 million items in the Bodleian Library's collection. In fact, it's said that every week about a thousand new things arrive, have to be catalogued, have to be stored. What a gift he gave to Oxford University. And he put his mark on this particular space by including his coat of arms in the ceiling above my head. You'll see it repeated many times. And in between, you'll notice there's the coat of arms of Oxford University as well, with the motto, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, the Lord is my light. It's repeated up and down the ceiling in front of me, this wonderful medieval ceiling. And on either side of me, there are portraits of the benefactors and the very important people connected with the library and with the university. 
So we're now in what's called the Selden end of the Duke Humphreys Library. This space was added in the 1630s, so it's the most recent addition to this particular bit of the Bodleian Library. Above my head, and they're quite hard to see in the dark actually, are these wonderful painted panels that apparently were rescued from a skip outside Christchurch College and repurposed for this ceiling. On the shelves next to me, there are books again in all sorts of different languages. As I mentioned earlier, there weren't that many English books in the original Bodleian Library. That was because Thomas Bodley believed that English was the language of the riffraff, not something that should be put on display in a library. You might expect these books to be very precious, but actually the most precious items in the Bodleian Library's collection are now stored deep underground in the Western Library. They have in their collection copies of the Gutenberg Bible, Jane Austen's manuscripts, and also two copies of the Magna Carta. And it's really worth going to the Western Library display where sometimes they have what's called Treasures of the Bodleian Library. So we're now standing in Convocation House, which was built between 1634 and 1637 as the meeting chamber for Convocation, the university's governing body. It was built here because William Lord, the Chancellor of the University, had decided that Convocation should meet in a designated building rather than the Church of St Mary the Virgin, where they had been meeting until that point. If you look, we've got Jacobean panels on the walls that are original to this building, uh, but the vaulted ceiling above my head was actually added in the 1700s. Behind me, you can see the grand throne where the Chancellor would have sat, and around would be the proctors and the doctors of divinity. One small detail that I'd like to point out is if you see in the window behind me, and there's another one over here as well, there are two rectangular panels surrounded by yellow glass. One of them has a dragonfly, the other has a flower. Those are actually sundials. What's missing is the knob that would have gone in the middle and would have cast a shadow you might be able to spot there are Roman numerals around the outside. One of the interesting things is that this one over here, the one with the dragonfly, has actually been placed in the window back to front. We're going to walk from here into the next door room, which is the Chancellor's Court. So here we are in Chancellor's Court, the court of the university. It moved here in 1637 at the same time as uh, the a convocation house next door and there have been many interesting trials here including in the 1870s Oscar Wilde was put on trial for failing to pay his bills to local suppliers. The invoice for that matter is now in the Bodleian Treasures collection. Over the course of time Oxford has been a notoriously violent place with lots of clashes between town and gown and it's said that there was a 30-year period towards the end of the 1200s when 29 murder cases were tried, and 12 of them were murders committed by students. You might expect the statue gracing the entrance to the old Bodleian Library to be that of Thomas Bodley. That would kind of make sense. But actually, this is William Herbert, the third Earl of Pembroke. And he's here in Old School Squad because he was the Chancellor of the University between 1617 and his death at the age of 50 in 1630. So he was here when this quad was actually installed. He also gave the library a very substantial donation of a number of books. And this bronze statue has actually only been here since uh, 1950. It was originally at Wilton House, his home in Wiltshire. Underneath the statue, there are two inscriptions and two coats of arms. That of his, the Earl of Pembroke's, and also on the other side, the coat of arms of the university, the motto we've become very familiar with, the Dominus Illuminatio Mea. This one has a little bit of a quirky twist to it though, because actually the top right corner of the page has been turned down and nobody actually knows why. Maybe it was just artist license. There's a door over there and actually there are doors all around this quad which have two heads on either side of them. The one over there nearest to me has the head of Duke Humphrey on the left hand side and Thomas Bodley on the right hand side. The 
bridge's size, an Oxford landmark so familiar that many of us assumed that it's been here for a very long time. But actually, when you look at the bridge itself from this side, you can see on the right, it says the date, 1913. And then over on the left, it tells you the name, Henricus Boyd or Henry Boyd. He was principal of the college between 1877 and 1922. And he was the person who appointed Thomas Jackson, whose work we've seen in the high street and the university examination schools as the architect for this structure. I called it the Bridge of Size, but really it should be called Hartford Bridge because it's part of the college, Hartford College. And it was built to connect two parts of the college, the old quad with the new quad. But it's known as the Bridge of Size because of its, well, some say resemblance to the Bridge of Size in Venice. That bridge was built in 1600 and it was built in order to connect the interrogation room of the Doge's Palace with the prison on the other side. And that's where the story comes from. That's why it's called the Bridge of Sighs, because it's said that as you went down into the, towards the deep, dark prison, you paused on the bridge, you looked out over Venice, and you let out a deep sigh. What do you think Hartford students sigh over as they cross this Bridge of Sighs in Oxford? The same architects crop up all over Oxford. The building behind me now was designed by Basil Champneys, who was also the architect for the Rhodes building on the High Street. This one was built in 1896, and it was the brainchild of the wonderfully named Sir Moynier Moynier Williams, who was the second Bowdoin Professor of Sanskrit at the university. His idea was to found a home for India in the middle of Oxford, a place of scholarship where India could be studied. Inside the building, there was a lecture room, a library, and also a museum. And he gathered funds for this project from all over the world, and particularly from this country and from India. At that time, there weren't many Indian nationals studying in Oxford, so it quickly became really a training ground for the Indian civil service. And sadly, by 1926, the money had run out. And so that museum collection, which by then was really quite a few rather rotting animals, had to be dispersed. It was given to other museums around Oxford and particularly just to the Pitt Rivers up the road. After that, in 1947, India achieved independence and so civil servants were no longer trained here. And then despite much opposition, in 1968, this became the home of the history faculty. And then in 2013, the home of the Martin School, a school that's been set up to look at the challenges of the 21st century. What's lovely about this building though is that it still retains its character as the Indian Institute and in fact that name is still above the door. And what you can see on the tower behind me now, there's an elephant, there's a nandi bull around the side, there are two lions, there are demigods above me and if you should be lucky enough to come through Oxford at night time you might see the weather vane on the very top lit up by a light. There's an elephant there and a howdah. So behind me now is the coat of arms of Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, architect and designer of the red telephone box. You can see his pair of compasses on the right hand side. He's there because he was the architect of this building, the first new Bodleian library which was built between 1937 and 1940. When it was first built, the idea was that it was going to house five million books and also to contain a fumigation room that represented death to bookworms. Sounds rather sinister. It wasn't universally popular. And in fact, James Morris was the one who described it as looking like a well-equipped municipal swimming bath. Since then, its fortunes have been reversed because between 2011 and 2015, it had a huge renovation and it's now been renamed the Western Library. It cost 78 million pounds and that money was donated by the Garfield Western Foundation. The idea behind it was to add 
uh, not only exhibition spaces, but also a very well-appointed cafe that you'll find on the ground floor. All around this building, you'll find cartouches just like that of Giles Gilbert Scott. There are 21 of them all together, and they were there when the building was originally built, and they were kept during the refurbishment. Not only do you find Scott, you also find the City of Oxford, coat of arms, and also that of John Radcliffe and Duke Humphrey, and many other notables connected with this library and with the history of Oxford. I'd just like to finish by telling you a story about the day on the 24th of October, 1946, when George VI arrived in Oxford with Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, to open the new library, an opening that had been delayed because of the Second World War. There was lots of pomp and ceremony, lots of robes, lots of big cars, and they arrived at a door just over there in order to put the key in the lock and open the library. George VI was presented with a very beautiful silver key, specially designed by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott. Unfortunately, when he inserted it into the lock, the top broke off. Bit of a problem. Luckily, the Vice Chancellor stepped in, he was able to fiddle it, the door opened, everything proceeded. But there is a wonderful bit of news footage that shows George VI with a broad smile across his face just after the event. What we're going to do now is we're going to hop across the road and look at those bearded heads that have been gazing beadily at me as I've been talking. I'm now in the rather unique position of being able to look deep into the eyes of one of the Sheldonian stone heads. These were originally commissioned by Christopher Wren, who was the architect of the Sheldonian Theatre behind in 1669. And at that point, there were 14 heads altogether. You can see them ranged all the way along here. A few years later, four more were added outside what was then the Ashmolean Museum. It's now the History of Science Museum. They're called by some the emperors, other people call them the philosophers. But actually, according to the building accounts, they're described there as being the termains. They mark the terminus, the boundary of the city. You might think, looking at them, that they're very ancient. And actually, they were described by John Betjeman as those mouldering heads outside the Sheldonian. But actually, the heads we're looking at now date only from the 1970s. They were carved by a local stonemason and very colourful character, Michael Black. And replacement was necessary at that point because the 19th century set were in bad disrepair. And actually, that set from the 19th century replaced the original ones from the 1660s that were carved by a stonemason called William Bird. The sooty Oxford air was not good for these stone heads. And there is even a story that actually when the second set were removed, they were put on the back of the lorry, fell off the lorry into the road and crumbled into dust. There are also all sorts of interesting stories about heads turning up in gardens around Oxford. There's one apparently in Worcester College and another one in Newnham Courtney. And if you look very carefully, you might be able to spot a bird on the back of one of these heads, a bird that could be said to reference maybe William Bird, stonemason, or maybe Christopher Wren himself. I'm now going to hand you over to the Pitt Rivers Museum to introduce you to a very special exhibition that I'm delighted that we've been able to make part of this film. Welcome to the Pitt Rivers Museum, the last stop on your tour of Oxford, and we are going to show you the Beyond the Binary exhibition and a little bit about why it's in the Pitt Rivers Museum. So hopefully you have been to the Pitt Rivers Museum. If you haven't, you should come. But this exhibition is about LGBTQ plus lived experience, but it also fits into a bigger picture in the Pitt Rivers. And there's a reason why this exhibition is called Beyond the Binary, because binary is either black or white, either yes or no. And the objects out there in the museum are beyond that. They have multiple stories. And what the museum's really 
working on it at the moment is bringing those voices into the museum. So you have the curatorial voice and the stories that the curator will tell, but you also have the stories of lived experience so that when people come into the Pit Rivers, they recognise themselves represented in the museum. And one of the outcomes of that is this exhibition, Beyond the Binary. And one of the community curators who worked with us on the project is Dan. And I'm going to hand over to Dan to tell you something about um, his experience of being involved in creating this wonderful exhibition. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Andy. One of the objects we'd like to highlight for you today is in our Indigenous Power Countering Colonialism exhibition piece. You see before you two bags very much alike. One of them is older, the S Black bag made around 1840s and the newer bag to the right made in 2019 by yours truly. These bags are in conversation with each other. Both of them were made by Métis artists using traditional indigenous beadwork practices with European materials. The older bag was owned by Samuel Black, who is a Scottish fur trader who went to what is now known as Canada to engage in the fur trade with the Hudson Bay Company, an English-owned company. The bag on the right exemplifies a queering narrative of Indigenous identity, something that the Indigenous community has long fought for and to have a resurgence of, as due to colonialism, a lot of traditional role models in the queer community have either had to go underground or are now being revived. That was great, Dan. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think it's time for us to go and have a look at the uh, telephone box. Let's go this way. This phone box, littered with stickers, exemplifies community coming together for the Beyond the Binary exhibition. Back in February 2019, one of our community curators was walking down the streets of Oxford and troubled with the transphobic messages and politics and just that were swirling around the UK, decided to impart some positivity on the streets of Oxford. Taking a pen and a reusable sticker, they wrote a positive message, trans happiness is real. They posted this sticker all throughout the city and what became one moment of positivity turned into an accidental campaign of trans happiness is real, also known as stickers against hate. As this community curator went back to the sticker that they had posted, they noticed that there were, got some negative feedback. The stickers were either scratched or written over with transphobic messages. Well, the community curator, not liking that, decided to put forth even more positivity through the streets of Oxford, where anonymous artists were invited to put stickers all throughout Oxford, as well as graffiti art, exemplifying support for their trans community, as well as the larger queer community. And what we have here is a foam box made with the colors of the trans flag, littered head to toe with stickers from our community and our visitors that really shows the community coming together in support of trans positivity, not negativity. Thanks, Dan. That was really interesting. That brings us to the end of your immersive tour of Oxford. We hope you've enjoyed it. Do come and visit Oxford again. And if you do, why not visit the Pitt Rivers Museum as well? Now, wouldn't it be great if we could finish off with a drone shot and maybe a crescendo of music? Thank you very much for joining us.